I stand up, take one step in front of the car, my weapon up. As he's running, he takes that one shot, crack hits me in the face. I take like two steps, go down by the car to mm -hmm. check on myself, and he stops and actually runs back the other way. Oh. So when I stand up, he had actually come back and flanks me. He's behind you at this point. So he had, so if I'm looking at 12, he's like at eight o'clock, mm -hmm. seven, eight o'clock. So I have, my, I have my gun up and I'm looking and the next shot takes the gun out of my hand and I'm your host, Quentin Harris. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Alex Stewart. Thanks for being here, Alex. Absolutely. And our guest, Lieutenant Brian Murphy. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me down. We normally talk about financial growth and, and leadership and mindset. And while this is a story that does involve some of that, this is a different type of setting for us today, Alex. I did want to warn our audience today that some of the content um, is, is not... Uh, is not for the faint of heart, and it's also not for the young of ears, but it is relevant to how we're going to present this today. So thank you for being on the show. I know you're going to walk us through a lot. Uh, we're going to have a lot of questions, but again, thank you for being here. No, again, I, I think it's a message of resiliency and facing adversity. And, oh, great way to put it. Uh, whether it's, you know, going back to the Stoics or the present, it's, it's, a, it's a story that I think is timeless. Uh, I think that's well said. Well said. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and kind of let you walk us through that. Okay. So uh, a lot of people don't know where Oak Creek, Wisconsin is, and I, I don't blame them. We're not a, not a huge city. I started back there in 91. Uh, I was from New York originally, uh, graduated, went to the Marines, came out, worked at the UN for a couple of years, uh, and then decided to come out to Wisconsin. And I uh, I, I, I got on with Oak Creek, very progressive department. Uh, but again, for an agency you've never heard of, a city you've never heard of, within an eight-year span, I was at two active shooting events. You know, bad shit picks you. That's mm -hmm. just the way it is. So, I, I mean, Oak Creek is, uh, when you look at the map, we're in uh, the far right-hand corner. We border the city of Milwaukee to the south. Uh, when I, when I started there uh, back in 91, we had 14,000 people, kind of a farming community at that point. Uh, at the end, we were uh, three times the size that we were uh, when I was there. Mm. Uh, but the funny thing is, it, uh, odd thing, when I started in 91, 14,000 people, we had 58 sworn. And then when I retired in 13, we had 36,000 calls for service up 500%, and we still had 58. Oh, wow. So in all of that, the, like calls for service, like I say, up 500%, uh, what do you do when you you still have the same amount of people, same equipment, everything else? You can see out, out of the 58 sworn, 26 were SWAT people, uh, which is a high amount of SWAT mm -hmm. for, a, for a small agency. But that goes back uh, to the first shooting that we had, uh, Back in 2004, we had a drug dealer uh, staying up a third third story of uh, a local hotel. Uh, gets annoyed at his girlfriend, uh, shoots her in the head. Goes out into the hallway. He's got a Mac 10 to 38, and just starts unloading as he's walking up and down the hallway. Uh, we get there, uh, the and my guy Bob was there in 30 seconds, just having to be up the block when it happens. Uh, long story short, the guy took a hostage. We asked the fire department, hey, get up here. And the fire department said no. And this is not new. This is still going on today uh, where fire departments won't enter a warm zone. Mm -hmm. uh, they're getting much better at it. Where, and I'm not blaming the fire department. That's policy. But it's all getting much better at that. Uh, so from that point, we upped our game. We got all kinds of equipment, got long guns in the cars, helmets in the cars, Shields in the cars, all this stuff, uh, because we, we realized right away you, you can't go into stuff outgunned. And again, sometimes we look at when bad uh, events happen, we look at the victimology, we looked at everything outside the departments. But when you have a small department, you know, I have 11 guys on my shift. Mm -hmm. This is all personal because we've grown together. So then when something bad happens, and we don't get, uh, I would say, on average in our city, maybe one to three homicides a year. 
-hmm. It's not a violent city whatsoever. Uh, and, and conversely, we've only had one other officer shot in the entire history of the department dating back to 56. So it's not, it's not necessarily a, uh, life on his razor's edge type, type place, but, but still the, the idea that it could happen wasn't lost on us. Now, that's all of us, and you're living in a city that's uh, probably higher middle class demographics, uh, no gang issues to, to speak of. We have, mm -hmm. Yeah, we have drug activity, some stuff, but nothing mega. But invariably, all those guys, uh, they know the... They know the way things run. So you don't cause trouble where you live because it just doesn't work that way. So, right. uh, and on the converse of this, you, you, you deal with everybody uh, on a daily basis, but you get that outlier. And, and the outlier is actually the perpetrator. You know, uh, I'm not going to mention his name unless it pops out accidentally because he's not worth it. Understood. Uh, but, you know, we, we talked about this and I pointed it out before, but you can see right on his shoulder the uh, the 14 mm -hmm. right here. So if you ever see 14 on someone, a tattoo or a logo like that, the, the 14 uh, comes from this guy, David Lane. So David Lane was a white supremacist anarchist, uh, wanted a race war in the United States. And I don't memorize the words because I don't want to give them homage, but it's something along the lines of we must uh, endure and secure an existence for white children. So 14 words, basically. Right, it, right that's exactly right. So it, it, you may not have ever heard of David Lane, but you know his protege, who was uh, Timothy McVeigh. Mm -hmm. So it, this is it, he's not this is not a new thing. Correct. And and the truth be told, he doesn't come. Uh, Page doesn't come from an area that was you know where he was picked on because he was white. He wasn't involved in any of this till he joined the military. So he grew up uh, in uh, Denver. His, it was raised by his grandparents, who his grandfather was a judge, spent a lot of time with his aunt and uncle. His uncle was a Colorado State Trooper. And according to his, his sister, everything was good with him until he joined the military. Hmm. And once he joined the military, he developed a drinking problem, and he became a racist. Uh, Those and, things typically don't go together. Well, no, he was actually followed by a professor out in Stanford who was doing a, 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 a thesis on the white supremacist movement. And he, they interviewed him. And one of his words that were that was quoted that came back was the, if you did two things, one, if you didn't join a military racist, you'll become one before you left. I did almost five years in the Marines. No, actually, it's the other way around because right. if you don't grow up with, you know, people of other nationalities, religions or whatever, all of a sudden somebody's throwing rounds at you, you don't really care anymore. It's, mm -hmm. We're on in this together. So he had used that. Um, and the other thing was becoming a full-fledged alcoholic while he was there, that actually got him kicked out. But he had said to the professor, the problem with the white supremacist movement is too much talk, not enough action. Mm. Point being was so now he's dating. He comes up to Wisconsin. He gets kicked out of the army. Uh, bounces around. He's a member of the Eastern Hammerskins in North Carolina. Bounces around. Comes up to Wisconsin. Meets a girl. She's a white supremacist for Volksfront. It's a white supremacist group founded out in jails in Portland. So now you have two people of the same ideology, violent ideology. Uh, and they're having the same arguments. You know, not enough gets done, blah, blah, blah. So what happens is simply this. He's dating in North Carolina. He's dating an American Indian girl, which is taboo because if you're a white supremacist, you should only be dating white girls. Uh, he comes up to Wisconsin. Nobody in North Carolina finds out about it. He comes up to Wisconsin, dates that girl. When they break up, she finds a picture of him with... The lady from North the, Carolina. The, right, the, the American Indian. She gets totally pissed off, calls down to Chicago where it's the home of the Northern Hammerskins. Mm -hmm. And they set a meeting up with him and kick him out. Now, for you and I and most people, if somebody kicked you out of their group or think of it, basically that's his job at this point. So if you get fired, you 
pick up and move on. But this was not his thing. Hmm. That uh, in his head, and as even the doctor who had done the, the thesis on him had described, was these were his only family. These were his, his bros and uh, getting kicked out was huge to him. So he followed this pathway of he quits his job. He calls the actual the American Indian girl in uh, North Carolina, and they talked about going back together. He told her he loved her, and she was okay with everything. And then mm -hmm. two days later, he enters uh, Badger Arms in West Dallas, Wisconsin, to get his Springfield XT 9 millimeter. So the, the thing, one of the reasons why I always bring up this picture is they're not, these people are not stupid. He's tattooed neck to ankles. It's hot in this part. He's and what does he yeah. show up in? A long sleeve white shirt. Right. So Almost a sweatshirt. Like. Exactly. Almost a sweatshirt. So he's making sure nobody sees his ink. Uh, and, and this part here to me is one of the biggest educational spots that are out there. And, and it's simply for this. While everybody else that you see at this range, and if you've ever been an indoor shooting range, mm -hmm. it's like this 99.9% .9 of the time. People are going shooting recreationally. Uh, let's see who gets the most bullseyes. Mm -hmm. But he is not. He is absolutely, every time he pulls that trigger, he is conditioning himself uh, to, it's called cognitive resiliency. Uh, simply put, he's imagining a head blowing up every time he's pulling the trigger. So then when it does happen, he's not affected. This guy, you know, when you tune in and see this photo, he's stone cold. Yeah. See, and that, that I mean, there's a, a, a great point there is if, if in fact you were thinking, I'm going to go on a mass killing spree, you would be excited, right? Mm -hmm. or nervous, or you would have something. But by constantly doing this, he shoots about 300 rounds a week. All these people practice their craft, and their craft, unfortunately, is killing. To hammer the point home, imagine you're going in to fight Mike Tyson. You're going to be, you know... Scared. Scared, and Mike Tyson is going to be eating a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. Take it to another level. Take it to a personal level. When was the last time you were upset and scared and had to do something? Your fingers don't work right. Your, your brain doesn't work right. You panic. This is where you are going to be against someone who does this every day, imagines killing people every day. So now he can walk through the building methodically doing what he had planned to do. Who's at a bigger advantage? Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. and, and I'm not just even talking from the victim's perspective. I'm talking from even from a law enforcement perspective. I mean, I, I, I was a cop for 23 years, and, you know, you're, you're driving, and that call comes in. Man with a gun or shots fired. Man, your heart rate goes up. Your breathing gets out of control. Then things go sideways pretty damn yeah. fast. And, and, again, it goes back to him this is a this is a skill. This is something that he is going to do. This is this takes almost a month from beginning to end to to come to fruition. So but now he's got everything in in place. Mm -hmm. The day before, on August fourth, two thousand twelve, he shaves his head. He takes his hammer skin patch, which meant everything to him and he mails it puts nothing in the envelope other than the patch and mails it to chicago just basically as a giant yeah i'm done f you to them you want to see now i'm going to show you mm -hmm. so he shows up at the temple and I, before this and I, I do want to preface this because the shooting takes place on sunday he went to the temple on tuesday now where the temple's located it's off the roadway uh, it, it really, you can't even see it from the roadway. And they don't get a lot of visitors. So to have someone come in and ask about the religion, they they thought this was great. And they brought him in. They showed him all around. So then he comes back Thursday evening, different group in the temple, mm -hmm. 
Same thing. Thank you for Bye. being here. We'll take you all around. Oh, by the way, why don't you eat with us? What do you call it? Case in the joint. Exactly. He's case in the joint. He's doing wow. his recon. He's doing his homework on us. And again, on the antithesis of this, the Sikh community are usually, they stay to themselves, generally speaking. So to have an outsider who wants to come in and look at this, that was, that meant a lot from the only, the only thing that set off a half a bell was when he was leaving. They saw him in the parking lot. It was about 7.30 at night. Saw him in the parking lot taking pictures of like all the way around the outside. And they thought that was odd. Yeah. So he's just doing entry points, exit points. Again, he was, he's in the military for six and a half years. So he's got the background. He knows how to do all this. So when the, the video plays, it's going to spin. And as you're looking at it, in the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to see a red truck. And that's, that's his truck. The building itself is 17,500 square feet. So the very first room here, for lack of a better term, is the cafeteria. Uh, after service, everybody sits together and they eat together. Uh, the next room coming around is the prayer area. Sits around probably 1,500 people you could fit in there. North side of the building, you have a conference room, three bedrooms, and a library. And then as it swings around, I'm going to see if we can hopefully make this work. So I want you to just imagine yourself. You're looking. Now you're going to come in the door. So you're going to come in that front door, which is what the bad guy does. First thing he sees is the room to the prayer area. Now it spins around. And you cannot go in the kitchen without going in that room, mm -hmm. which takes you back into the cafeteria. Giant passageway here. And the only way in the kitchen area, these two doors. Now the, the red lines are trajectory rods. So it's just showing where rounds came in. So you can see one to the left and then two meet. That's called the point of convergence. And then this machine here is just a microwave oven. And there's three more rounds that go in there. Okay. So that just just to give you a, a, a fairly easy layout of the building. So it's 1025 Sunday mornings. First call is going to come in from a woman who had just driven into the parking lot. The one way, sir, emergency. Yeah. Uh, Can I have a transfer to the Sikh temple? Oh. What's going on? Um, yeah, I was just in the parking lot going to go in, and um, I hadn't even parked yet, but I heard gunshots, and someone was shot. I, I think that someone was shooting. Some guy was, he was bald. I left, you know, because I didn't, my kids were in the car, but he was bald, and um, he had glasses on, and I think he shot somebody with a turban, and... Um, I'm, I'm there, but I left the site, but I, um, but I okay. just uh, wanted to let you guys know. Okay. Uh, he went inside the temple. He's planning on shooting other people. Listen to the way her voice changes now. Mm -hmm. Do you see the individuals inside? I, I didn't see him inside. It's on the parking lot. He shot. He shot somebody. There were shots heard. Okay. Okay. Oh. We're we're sending on it. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. okay. Be safe. Go out of the area. So one of the things that it, you'll, you'll hear is that initially she said, I heard the shots and I left because I had kids in the car. But then her voice changes and it's, a, it's an anomaly. She said, I left the area. I had kids in the car. But then she describes how he shot the man and then went into the building. But if you left the bill, if you left the lot, you can't even see the roof of the building. So really what it is, and we've all done this, where you drive by a car accident that's on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Your brain is saying, I should drive my car and keep going. But what do you do? Rubberneck. Right. Your brain is saying move. And you are, in theory, your brain is moving, but you physically haven't made that happen. Right. So that's really all that's about. And I know it's not a, it's not a big thing, but it technically it is because she's watching something transpire. So what actually happens is this black car that's here, uh, he's in front of the shooter. Okay. He drives in a lot, parks on the north side of the, the lot up against uh, that that wall that goes to an industrial park. And it just so happens there's guys paving a lot that Sunday morning, just beautiful day. Bad guy comes in, he goes the exact opposite. He goes to the, the south side of the lot turns his car, faces in, so he can see everybody in the lot, he can see whoever's driving in, and he can see the building. 
Now, at the same time, there's two kids. They are 10 and 7 at the time. I'm going to play them for you because they're outside. Their parents had just left. Yeah. Bench, and we were just, you know, playing a little game of tag. And we were just having a good time. Yeah. And then later on, I saw a Caucasian gentleman walking out of his car and approaching two men who were kind of like the priests, you could kind of say, of this Gurdwa. Slowly and slowly, he just picked up his pace and started speed walking. And all of a sudden, from his like belt buckle, like right around his waist area, he pulled out a gun and shot them both. Kind of in shock, but I kind of just had to come out of it because my sister and I were there. So I grab her hand and we run towards the door. We were in the kitchen cooking, you know, like 10, 15 ladies. Then one boy and girl came from our, from the hall, and this is somebody shooting outside. I was like, there's a shooter outside. They thought someone was like had a camera and was like shooting people. Yeah, I was in the kitchen. They grabbed my arm and telling me, uncle, uncle, shooting, you know. I was thinking, you know, what the hell they're talking about? And they're like, what shooters? And like, they kind of didn't believe us. And I started crying. I was like, there's a shooter outside. And they heard a gunshot. They looked outside of the window and they saw the two men like lying on the ground. It's not even a minute. He came, started shooting into the hall. So lady coming from uh, this hall, she got shoot over here in the arm. And she told me that guy coming with gun, he's going to shoot everyone. Then, you know, I was so scared. Everybody's scared, you know, what happened. Uh, the part that always bothers me the most is it's that little girl's birthday. So for the rest of her life, her birthday is going to be the anniversary of this. And how... Mm. How horrible is that? You know what I mean? You're seven years old and now that's what you got to look forward to. So now there's a guy next door talking about the shooting. He's in a church with a gun? Yeah, yeah. He's shooting. He's still shooting. I can hear it in there. He's in there shooting people. He's it's in the there back. shooting people? Yeah, uh, that's my guess. He had a gun. He was shooting on the outside. And then we see him run in there. Uh, a bigger guy, white shirt. Bigger, okay. Bigger gentleman, white male? Yeah, white male looked to be, I mean, we were 100 yards away, we were doing a lot next door. Okay, a bigger, okay, a white male with a gun. Uh, what, can you tell me anything else? Uh, it was a handgun, that's all I know. A handgun, what was he wearing? Uh, white shirt, that's all I've really seen. A white we, shirt? We get out of the way. <laughs> white shirt? I don't know, it's right next door, it's uh, some kind of temple. We're at, uh, there's, we You're right, it's, people. right, it's, we already have officers responding. Okay. Okay. Uh, We've we, we, we seen him kind of go in, and we just heard some more uh, shots fired, so we're thinking it's not good. Okay, and you did hear shots. And your oh, workers, yeah. I, 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 where are you working? Sorry, what? Your workers? Okay, we'll be, we're sending people. We're getting okay. multiple calls. Okay. So they're basically sitting there watching from... Uh, Next door perfect, across yeah, the street. They're, they're right there watching it, and they can hear all these shots going off. So when the bad guy comes in, he's shooting from this front door, which is down here. So the like the two kids said, the lady's in the kitchen, which is this way. She, like most people, wouldn't immediately think, oh, we have an active shooter situation. Like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Let me go look. So when she turns the corner, she gets to here. Bad guy comes in the door, right from the front door, shoots, hits her just on the forearm. Uh, she goes running back, and as she's running back, Mrs. Cower uh, is coming from the kitchen area. The woman that got shot says, go back, go back. He's going to kill everybody, and Mrs. Cower says, I'm going in to pray. God is going to protect me. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Cower, as she's walking across or running across, he takes one shot, hits right here by the hinge. You can see on this. It's right around hinge high. Now, it's difficult to see, but when you come in, there's like a five-foot vestibule area, and then there's like four steps that go up to the prayer platform, and everybody goes up there. So Ms. Gower doesn't even go up the stairs. She just comes in, button hooks, turns the corner, goes down on her hands and needs to pray. He comes in right on top of her, boom, 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 shoots her four times and kills her. Now... The only thing that I didn't get, and and 
luckily, if he'd have purely done or if he'd have done really good homework, he would have waited 20 minutes because service would have been almost on and it would have been packed. Mm. And he just could have walked straight in. There was no security. There was no nobody to question his entrance. Just walked into that room and unloaded. You know, there's a lot of more answer questions. But so now there's nobody else in the prayer room. He comes back out and think of it this way. You just walked up the end of the hall, open the door at the end of the hall. And so then when he comes back out, he's facing where he came in. Is a hallway left and a hallway right. And uh, at the time, while he was going after Mrs. Cow, this this gentleman was on the phone with us. Oh, Creek 911, where's your emergency? Oh, emergency, you are talking. There's a person, uh, person fired 16 at the 20 round in the sick temple of Wisconsin. Okay, you're in the sick, sick temple? Bobby okay. Rosen. Oh, Rosen. What's Rosen. going on? Rosen. Yeah. What's going on? What? What's going on? Sick temple of Wisconsin, people are firing up. 60 round, they fire the police. Uh, police is not reaching. What is that? the thing is going on? Okay, we have around? officers in route. Well, I don't get in round. The white guy is uh, doing firing at least. He did 50 They're fighting? Rounds. Is there a gun? Oh, gun. He was the white guy is doing the firing already. 15 round. He... Okay, we have officers oh, there. Oh, oh, oh. And that's the last words that man ever says. I asked a uh, party who's, well, we'll get to it, but his, uh, his his father was killed there. I asked, what was that conversation that was going on? Because if you listen, mm -hmm. he's talking to us, but there's a side conversation. So he's talking to his wife. That door that's at the end of the hall goes down to the basement. The basement has a steel door that's locked. So if you listen, the kid said, Half went to the kitchen, half went the other way. This is the other way. So his wife, this gentleman's wife, is saying, come with us, hurry up, come with us. And he's saying, no, take them and go. You just go. And the, the way the, the shots go, uh, they start about two feet to the dead man's right, and they're every six inches up the wall till it hits him. Because you hear pop, 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 mm -hmm. and then you hear him. I don't know why he walks the rounds, but it wasn't sporadic. They were yeah, a line. definitive line going against them. And, you know, this speaks to that gun range conversation we were just having. I mean, those, the, the, the spacing, if you may, the clusters, the line, the linear line, the way he did that, like this is part of that process that could have been recognized early on at a gun range, that you're seeing a marksman there that's desensitized, potentially shooting 300 rounds a week. Right. You know, at that, 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 that point, hey, that that's not normal. Exactly. That's not normal. Right. The only downside to that is they hide well. Mm. They just do. Here, here's like a guy that. that grew up always being under the radar. Even mm. his sister said that. Never did anything great, never did anything bad, just that Mr. Vanilla, do you know what I mean? Didn't draw attention, didn't did, just was that guy. Uh, so now he gets done shooting him, continues down the hall. There's a doorway here on the left and a doorway on the right. So he goes to the doorway on the left first, and inside that room is this guy, Baba Punjab Singh. He's a 65-year-old priest visiting from India. The door is closed over but not locked. It's ajar, uh, and he pushes the door open, and Bob is on his hands and he's praying, uh, and he shoots him right in the face. Uh, bullet goes in right next to his nose because of the angle, uh, clips his spinal column, turns him into a quadriplegic, and then he gets, uh, unfortunately, has a stroke on top of that while he was waiting for us to come and render aid. And I know, I know his son, and I've, I've actually, on the 10th anniversary, I got to meet his grandson. Uh, the thing about Baba is, here's a guy who has no military. He's got, he, he, he's just a priest, and he couldn't communicate. Uh, he could only blink, and he had this thing. Then in the Sikh faith, there's a thing called tridikala, and it means having uh, optimism in the face of adversity. 
And the thing about Baba, I talked to his son extensively and he's like, you know, here's the thing. My dad feels like God chose him for this. So he doesn't back away from this. Not poor me. This is like, look what I'm capable of that God gave me this challenge. And I always look at that because, I mean, every three months I go get Botox injections in my throat, which suck to no end. You know, I'm in Wisconsin, so it's always cold and uh, the rounds cause arthritis in my hands and all that. So there's days where it sucks, mm -hmm. you know, but I always think of Baba and I'm like, man, I can sit here and wrap my, you know, my blanket of pity around me and say, poor me. But the truth is there's this guy who didn't have near the training I had and he looks at it like a blessing. Now I can get up and talk and eat and do whatever. How dare I look for pity when there's a guy who thought, this is still good. I, I can't get out of this bed. My mind is sharp. And so really, you're like a prisoner in your own head. And he, so whenever I'm like having a bad day, mm -hmm. I think of Bob and I'm like, no, it is, it, if, if you got to break out the, here, let me show you my bitching card. Mm -hmm. It better be pretty freaking big. Wow. You know what I mean? You know, so, it offers up some perspective, doesn't it, Alex? Well, it seems like he had, uh, while he didn't have military training, he had mindset training. I mean, if you talk about someone who has probably worked his whole life to to get his mind to a certain place, that's really what it seems like has gotten him there and has propelled him. Absolutely, and and obviously being a priest, right? Uh, and and following the the one of the basic tenets of of Sikhism is that, and I'm like, but still, it, you know, it's always one of those things, and we've all done this a thousand. Well, if that was me, I right. know what I do, right. but when the rubber meets the road, right? When yeah. you wake up and this is what it is, you know, it's, uh, and, and unfortunately, Baba died to be passed two years ago. Uh, but I always, I always look for him for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I, I, again, he was just visiting, shouldn't have been there. But wow. I mean, he was put in that place. When it's your time, yeah. it, it is. So now on the flip side of this, we go back to what we had talked about earlier. So when he comes up to the other door, this door, he doesn't pound on it, it's closed. He doesn't pound on it, he doesn't ratchet the handle, he does the exact opposite. He just taps on the door three times. This is this is literally something out of a horror movie. Ab absolutely. This part, Ab absolutely. I mean, all of it is, but this this particular part. And it shows you specifically his demeanor. He's thinking through the whole process, he's going through his, you know, okay, doors locked, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. These are all things thought, planned out, and now he's executing at to at, at, well, near perfection. Mm -hmm. So he knocks on the door. If you were in that room and you heard that quiet knock, what are you, you think are you going to do? You think it's a child. You think it's someone there that you want to help. And, and, you know, that's exactly what he knew. That's it's, the worst part of, that, that's of what, what he's doing. That's the part that bothers me the yeah. most out of all this because the next gentleman who opens the door he opens it like most people would using the door as a kind of shield but I still got to look out and the bad guy's just standing there with the gun waiting so as soon as he sees half his face he shoots him right through the eye uh, and he goes down and then as he enters the room think of it like a hotel room uh, there's a little closet here uh, there's a desk you can see this Mr. Kalika he's in the back uh, the room goes this way there's a bathroom in the back. To the then, back left. There's a bathroom yeah, to the, back to the left. right would be your closet. Right. And then in, if, as soon as you came in the room, it opens up. There's a bed along this wall. So as the bad guy makes entrance, Mr. Kalik is in the back, and he has his hands up, and he's begging him, put the gun down, please, we can talk. And as the bad guy enters the room, he does look off to his left. There's a guy standing on a bed. He spins and boom, 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 shoots him three times in the stomach and then runs out of ammo. So the guy who gets shot in the stomach jumps off the bed, runs completely out of the building and just by happenstance lands on the only house on that entire block of a person who can help him. He falls on Jim Hazy, who is a retired paramedic, special forces guy. <laughs> wow. And if he doesn't fall on that lawn, he's, he's going dead. to die. Hmm. But Jim calls the PDs like I got something I got a guy and 
our our dispatch centers overrun at this point with 911 calls and everything else. I mean, you could kind of hear it in the calls earlier. But the, the, people the, stress answering calls, the stress is there. So any, they, every 911 call is getting sent to them. There's only mm -hmm. two dispatchers. One works fire, one's working police. So they're trying to answer 911, direct us, get us. It's, it's, it's a shit show yeah. at this point. But Jim, <laughs> Jim's like, okay, runs in his house, gets his med kit, jumps out, stuffs the wound. We're a small department. He, he just retired from the fire department like three, four months before this. So he calls the rigs that are up the block. They throw the guy in a rig and he's fine. Wow. But now he walks in a room. He reloads his gun. Mr. Kalik is there. He's got no military, no uh, no law enforcement, but he's, he's the president of the temple. He's mm -hmm. the shepherd of the sheep. And he's begging him, please... You know, you don't need to do this. Boom, he shoots him. He goes down. So in a Sikh faith, is uh, these five Ks, and one of the Ks is a kirpan. It's a small ceremonial knife, probably about as big as that remote. Size is your clicker. Right. It's not sharp. It's just... It's about four inches. Yeah. Yeah. And that, on a good day, you could cut a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's it. It's not for this. But Mr. Kalika grabs him around a leg and starts stabbing him in the leg. Boom, boom, shoots him two more times. The Karpan goes out of his hand. And and Kaliku has no training. He knows if I don't do something, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. So he takes his hands and he wraps them as hard as he can in the pants uh, that the bad guy's wearing, takes another round, and then the bad guy actually steps on his back so he can pull his leg away from Kalika and takes Kalika's fingernails with him. I mean, it's it, it's insane, and what he does there will have ramifications mm -hmm. very shortly. But he does kill him. And the other part of this is, when everybody started running, Kalika took a mother, a father, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, and hit him in that back bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't do that, that family he's dies. on to the next room. Yeah. Right. So, so now, at this point, victim count is. We have five. Is it five? Well, he he kills two outside. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Kalika. Uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Cowers. Three. Baba. Well, he shot Baba. He shot the other woman in the arm, and then uh, the gentleman at the end of the hallway. Right. So yeah, he's a. Well, that's like he said five, five or six, yeah. five or s wow. And this is this Actually, is less that's, than that's the last person. Kalika is the last one he kills. So he's at this point he's. Probably two and a half, three minutes in this place. Not even, believe not it even. or not. Wow, not it feels even. like that. It's not even that. It, long. Yeah, it's uh, from the time we get the call, I'm there in a minute fifty nine. Wow. So, it, so in it, a minute fifty nine, less than a minute fifty nine, he's already done this damage. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Well, no, it, he's not. I, I take it back because he's not up to the kitchen yet. So this is all this. It's like ninety seconds. Yeah. Think about that's, that. That's how Think fast. About that. That's how fast this is going. Ninety seconds. Right. And he's being methodical. Do you know what I mean? He's not running anywhere. Right. He's just. He took the time to knock on the door. So it's in his head. This is in a race. I always ask this question: What's your, what's your definition of a warrior? I bring this up because, I look at Mr. Kalika. And I think that's the epitome of a warrior. He's protecting people in the mm -hmm. temple. He He's giving his life up to the point that he has nothing except his hands and loses his fingernails before he dies. And 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 I use this because I think of Kalika and I think this is one of the most fitting descriptions of a warrior. And, and, and I bring it up because we get we get so taken into the military the you know barbarian barbarians yeah. and the truth of the matter is this everybody in his building is a warrior everybody on its street is a warrior to some degree mm -hmm. it's what is it that you refuse to quit i learned all of that up there from my mother when i came back and i was in a marine so you would think i know i knew all about warriors mm -hmm. but not till i came home and i watched my mom die of cancer and i watched her fight it every day that I realized, oh man, my mom doesn't give up. So I, I will never give up. And then my sister got cancer and I watched her die. My mom died at 49. 
My sister died at 50. And they're both freaking warriors because they battled it for as long as they could. And sometimes that battle is getting out of bed in the morning. Mm. Sometimes that battle is going to work. And no one, man, is going to be a bad day. My kid's sick. My my better half is sick. This is, I'm not making the money I want, but you're there anyway. You do it anyway. And and to me, that's, we get so wrapped up that warriors are other people, but you you are a warrior. If you're mm-hmm. if you're here and you're breathing and you do anything that you don't want to do, you're still living that warrior lifestyle. Not everything has to be, you know, and I talk about, not everything has to be busting knuckles or pulling a trigger. Mm-hmm. Some, that, that the hardest battles are the ones we never see, you know? Well said. Uh, so now up in the other end of the temple is Mrs. Kalika, and I bet this is a quick one, but if you can just look to see uh, how small the pantry is. One of the ladies had a key to the basement, and everyone who was eating, they ran to the basement with her. Please go in the basement and lock the door. The rest of her, we are in the kitchen, we all go in the pantry. We says, hurry up, go in the pantry. He's here. So then we all ran into the pantry. The pantry is a very small space. There was 15 people, including my sister and I. And uh, once we had closed the door, we tried hearing the outside sounds. How big is that pantry? This, this table's bigger than yeah. that yeah. pantry. Four oh, feet by, by three feet? I mean, something. That 15 people wouldn't fit on this table. All right, and they have 15 people yeah, in there. That's not happening. So... He comes down the kitchen, or he, he comes he comes down to the kitchen, and one of the things they do, I talked about it before, cooking a Langer meal before, so they have stoves going. So three of the women are inside that pantry and said, if we don't go out and shut off the stoves, we're going to burn to death, because if that starts on fire, we have no way out. Right. So they're on the other side of the Pepsi machine. They start out. He sees them and starts shooting. Mm-hmm. And he shot six rounds at them, does not hit them. Which I think is really important to this story. It, it, it's huge in as much as the distance is from the camera on the left photo. So basically from here to there, which is all of about 20 feet. So he, he takes six shots at three people and doesn't touch them. And and it, to give you a... a, a the perspective on it, mm-hmm. these are the three rounds. They're under the post-it note. So, I mean, it's not like he doesn't know how to shoot. That group... I was going to look at the group. Within two inches I mean, of it, each it's shot. It's ridiculous, but that's right at the pantry door. So now, as he's going to chase them around, and now there's nowhere for them to go. Those 15 people are behind that... <laughs> sorry. No they're, they're behind that pocket door, which the rounds he's using will go through that, like, there's no door, period. But when he looks out the window, he just happens to see, and this goes back to Kalika, because if Kalika doesn't Slow try to stop him, they all die. That's that's not for debate. That's defend, you know, absolute. But this is just when my squad comes. So as soon as my squad comes in, he leaves everybody and then comes outside. So to put in perspective for the audience... Kalika slows him down, and as he's entering this kitchen where the pantry is located, and he doesn't know there's 15 people in there, he just sees three ladies pass right. that he misses and shot selectively. He sees out this window in his 12 o'clock, your squad car pulling up. Right. And it's that moment right then and there. He stops on a dime and says, all right, I'm changing directions. Exactly. Otherwise, we've got you know 15 other people we're talking about. Right, 15 women and children are going to mm-hmm. die. And, and and again, I I always look at Kalika. Mm-hmm. Kalika is the 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 warrior, the warrior in this whole thing. Well, uh, and did he slow him down? What ten seconds? You think? I mean, it, it couldn't yeah, have been could, exactly. Right. Could, that's that's impressive. Max. Yeah. It, it, but even then, ten seconds is, you know, what can happen in ten? Look what he's done in basically a minute and a half. Right. So ten seconds is a, is pretty substantial. Yeah. So, so now it's just going to look like this. The uh, bad guy's car is down here. So uh, you're going to see me drive up. Mm-hmm. you see the bad guy come out. 
Uh, bad guy is actually going to start running this way towards his car. Uh, and at this point, we're talking about 100 yards, 150 yards. Uh, from my car to the front is probably about 70. Okay. And then, but it, that'll close because once I get out of the car, I, I, I start heading to the temple uh, entrance. So it, it definitely gets it down. Uh, Sam comes in. Uh, Sam and the, and the bad guy go at it. That's 90. Okay. Uh, initially, it's a 90-yard thing. Then he drives up, and that's 76 yards where he starts laying down rounds. Uh, Sam hits him, and he falls behind this median, uh, and we go from there. So. And Sam, for the audience, was a sniper marksman. Right. He was a, uh, at this point, he's got 25 years as a marksmanship in, uh, instructor and, and he, uh, all he's that able time to get a shot sniper. on, it's not, excuse me, a shot on the assailant. Right. And then did you know at this time that he was to your six o'clock when you pulled up facing? No, no. Okay. Uh, no, not till, uh, not till after. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I bring this up because sometimes we get wrapped up on what's important and what's not important. So to, for me, you know, the, the, the true keys to, to, to human performance are more than anything, you got to breathe. It's your breath. The minute your breath is out of control, you're out of control. That, that, that's not debatable. Think about any time you've sprinted and you're, you're huffing and puffing. What could you actually do when you're huffing and puffing? And if I told you to do some trigonometry or I told you to do manual dexterity, you couldn't do it. So now make that sustain where you're almost out of breath. What happens then? And the truth of the matter is I, you know, I'm a, I, I love Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I, you mm -hmm. know, MMA, I, I, I think it's awesome. But if you watch those guys in the ring, nobody's out of control. They're always in control. You can see guys, somebody's even on their back and they're – their brain is going, okay, what do I do here? Mm -hmm. You know, two on one and do all this stuff. And that to me is the key. And it did. I'm not talking about even fighting for your life. I'm talking about your three-year-old will not do what you want them to. Do you know what I mean? You, you That's where you need to breathe. So you don't let the, the kid get the better of you, you know? Uh, and, and, and with all that, it all comes down to control. And we get, as a society... We get so wrapped up in, well, I need to be in control. And, and the truth of it all is you can only control you, nothing else. Everything else is going to happen whether you're there or not. So the quicker you learn, I can, whatever the event is, I can only choose my reaction to the event. Mm -hmm. I can't control the event in any way, shape, or form. You can't even control your two-year-old. No. You can't. The best you can do is influence them to make a decision that's in line with you. And yes, you can make the argument, well, they're two years old, you could pick them up, you know, and, and do whatever. But you're not changing their mentality. You're not changing their thought process. You're just changing their physical them. location at that point. I, exactly. It. So it, again, it still comes back to, it, and, and again, you go, to, you go back to the octagon. They know I can only control how I react to the punch, the faint, the choke, that's it. So, uh, again, it's it, it's all of it. And the, the other one for me is you got to forget. Uh, if you don't forget, you breed fear because anything that happens that's related to one thing is, well, that was bad. It caused me pain, so I'm totally going to avoid that. You know, as a buddy of mine, Tony Blower, he has fear is false expectations appearing real. Because we do way more damage in our brain on what's going to happen. And I'm freaking horrible at it. I'll be – if you ever watch me, even watch a freaking fight, I'm like this. You know, I'm like, Duh! and then you realize, what the hell am I doing? Right. You know, it, 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 this isn't me. This, you know, that happened. So the quicker you can forget and move on and say, okay, I'll take that learning experience with me, but I'm not going to put myself – Way back, and, and I'll give you a, a, a real good example. We used to train in law enforcement all the time that uh, this is before simunitions, so pellets and all that good stuff. We used to just do wooden guns, mm -hmm. right? It'd be a, a blue gun. 
and we do the pew pew training like okay pew pew you're down so what did we train people to do not to forget but i remembered that when i got shot even in training i went down and i stopped fighting so uh. what did we do we train generationally if you get shot you stop because we didn't teach them to forget and go okay here's a new thing this is the way it's got to be we train them not to forget you get shot you go down you're out of the play and that, that that's that's i'm just giving you an example this yeah, no. yeah, it's all over the place so the quicker you can say bad shit happen step over it take whatever piece you need to go and move on the better off you're going to be i love that false expectations appearing real yeah that's fantastic. Has this ever led you to meditation? I mean, this this yeah. to me seems right in line with, uh, you know, going to the present, letting the outside disappear, and, and again, going right into what you're talking about. I, I try. I suck at it. <laughs> uh, I do. I, but, and, and we'll get into it later, but every day you try and do a little bit. Right. So well, that's that warrior mentality, right? You, it's showing up that matters more than so anything. I, I, it's funny when you, you you broke this out and you're like, what's your one more? Every day, that's all you need. You just need mm -hmm. that one more thing. That one, one side. It doesn't have to be monumental. And we get, we get so freaking wrapped up in, I gotta conquer the world. No, you don't. You gotta take one piece of sand from there and move mm -hmm. here, and you've made progress. Mm -hmm. You gotta read a book for a couple of minutes a day. Well, I only, I, I couldn't read the whole book. I only got 10 pages. That's 10 pages more than you did. It's good. Learn something every day. Get be wise every day. That pick something up from somebody else every day. It's all about that learning experience. It's all about, that's what gets you happy. Sure. And in the life, that's what freaking makes you happy is, I can't control anything. I'm back to me. And if I can be happy that, you know what? I meditated a couple more minutes than I did yesterday. That's a good <laughs> Ten day. Ten seconds is all you need. Right. right. And then it, especially if you do it at the end of the day, it's a good cleanse. Right. When I, when I work second shift from uh, 3 in the afternoon until 11 o'clock at night, I didn't sleep till 4 in the morning because you just replay and replay and replay and replay. For what? I can't change any of that happened. So why am I losing sleep? Why am I hurting my health? Why am I hurting my happiness by going back to shit mm -hmm. that I can't ever fix? Yeah. I can't move any of it. Well, and just to share also, when I first heard this, the breath piece was what hit me the hardest. And yeah. ever since I've heard that, there have been many times where I've said, go to your breath, control your breath. We learned it uh, from chasing people in cars. Right. Mm -hmm. And things always went bad because the first guy who was in the chase would take it personally and then wouldn't handle the car properly because they're too wound up. And so we were wrecking cars and people, and you're like, no, no, what do we do? So then that's what you do, breathe. Yeah. And we did box, you know, this, there's apps for everything. And I, I don't, there's a, a guy I know, Brian McKenzie, does this thing called Shift. Mm -hmm. If you look him up on Instagram, S-H-I-F-T, just go there. Because he has all the science behind it where I'm just like, I hear blah, 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 mm -hmm. breathe. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, where it's like mitochondrial this. And right. Well, you know, it. I mean, it's uh, it's even on our Apple Watches. I noticed we're all wearing something like that. It, it's it's on there for a reason, you know, because they've yeah. done studies that show breathing two minutes a day, just just calm breathing. You know, the funny you. thing is, too, and not only because Brian was talking, Brian McKenzie was talking about it, was, and, and uh, Lieutenant Grossman, we're talking about the when trauma happens, if you're able to control your breath and trauma, you're then your uh, likelihood of developing PST drops dramatically. Interesting. It's because you, if you do it the other way, it's because you have the trauma and you're losing control of yourself to the utmost mm -hmm. that that it's will always stay with you yeah, yeah. there's that yeah. uh that synergistic yeah. thing and and the more you realize that you're like that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. even if bad stuff is going if i can just kind of deal with it then it, it's not going to affect me as deeply so interesting all right so i uh, here it is plain and simple uh this is this is the route i uh, Six. 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 Six.
I'm taking report of an altercation, Sick Temple, 7512 South Howell. There's a lot of noise. I'm unable to get much info, but there's a fight, and now it's... Six five copies from three oh one. Ten four. Three from American. Ten four. Six six from Ryan will take it to you. How there may be reports of gunshots. A bald male with glasses may have shot someone. I'm going to dispatch fire department for state. Fire is responding also. Two to those. Give me the location again, please. Sick Temple, 7512 South Health. 6 8 code 3 for location. Hey, this is Will from 301. Give me the info on uh, who is leaving the, or if they're still on scene with the gun. Last I heard is a balding male with glasses may have gone inside with a gun and there were shots fired. We'll be going 23, I see. Stand for. One down, give me an ambulance. Message received. Pull down. Uh, I need an ambulance. I do not see a shooter anywhere. And I am on the, uh, just come in behind me. Unit, we're dispatching fire. 78 copies coming up on Hollow Forest Hill, 1033. Uh, 85, 1033. So, yeah, the first thing you're going to see is the guy won't get out of my way. So I got lights and sirens on. We get the call for service that it comes in as a possible fight. Mm -hmm. So I think come in as an active shooter, just possible fight. And then as I'm going, the guy finally gets out of my way. Then we get possible shots. Uh, and I know I'm going to be there about the same time as Sam Lender. We're both uh, coming from different areas of the city, but both equidistant to the temple itself. So as I'm going, I'm running in my head, what am I going to do? Uh, if, if it is somebody shooting it, I did go back to uh, several months prior. There was a fight there. So when the, the two people who both attended the temple fought each other, that was another piece of the puzzle. I'm like, oh, I wonder if these guys are back at it. Now somebody brought a gun. Uh, and then once I get there, uh, I pull over to rise in a hill uh, scan, I, I see what appears to be one guy down, uh, go up on him, uh, jump out of the car, check, it looks like he's dead. Uh, what I didn't know is actually there's two of them. So that black car that originally pulled up mm -hmm. that the kids saw, uh, one brother gets it, there's two brothers in a car, one gets out of the passenger seat, starts moving towards the trunk, the brother who was driving gets out, driver's seat starts moving to the trunk, bad guys coming across and if you listen to the kids he's like he's walking then he starts speed walking but when he's walking the one brother actually raises his hand and says hey come inside have tea hmm. and that's when the gun comes out so the one brother actually tried to protect the other brother uh and laid on top of him and he shot through both of them and killed them both but you'll hear me say i got one down uh it's just because there's one head and they were both priests so there was I only saw one set of appendages. So then you'll, you'll see him come out of the temple, uh, start running to running to his left, man. And uh, I, that's the part that kills me. Uh, that I'm Almost literally, but figuratively, mm -hmm. I can't. I have the hardest part with it because he comes out of the temple, he's running. Uh, I don't see the gun right away, but the minute I see the gun, I shoot. And he's running away from me, 42 yards, not looking at me, just shoots over his shoulder as I'm moving at the same time. So just put it contextually, law enforcement shooting against a moving target have a hit rate of 
Eight. Eight, zero eight. Uh, and he's running, not looking, shooting one-handed. Over his yeah, shoulder. With, a, over with his a shoulder. pistol. He just, with the pistol, he just yeah. throws his arm back, cracks a shot, and that hits me right in the face. So it hits the bottom of my jaw, goes down my throat. Uh, and it felt like a punch. It, it, more than anything, it just felt like a good stiff punch. Uh, I, I get behind a car, I check myself quick, uh, and I'm like, okay. And first thing in my head is, oh, oh shit, you're in a gunfight. Mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, well, let's get it on. So I start looking for him. And uh, the funny thing about this, and, and it's another one that you don't get until you do it, you're not wearing hearing protection. Mm. So oh, when mm-hmm. you shoot your gun, it's like your deafening. hearing's now gone. Yeah, done. pretty much. It's gone. It's gone. We had uh, HK USB 45s, so my hearing's pretty pretty well toast. And there's more shots coming, but I can't tell where they're coming from. So it's loud ringing at this point. Yeah, yeah it's almost that, disoriented. That, it's like ringing. pip pip pip, and I'm like, all right, I know it, but I'm looking for feet. Now, when I say this. He came out and he ran to his left, my right. Mm-hmm. So where would you look for him? If you lost sight of him for a second, where would you look for him? Yeah, where he was going. Exactly. Forward. He didn't come yeah. out like, hey, where am I? No, it was like, I have a reason. So that was my first inclination is, all right, he's got to be going that way. Nothing. So I'm behind the car, uh, but, you know, the engine block and all that. And I'm like, this isn't good. So... Uh, there's a thing called being on the X. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be in one spot too long. Uh, so I stand up, take one step in front of the car, I uh, have my weapon up. And what had happened was he, as he's running, he takes that one shot, crack hits me in the face. I take like two steps, go uh, down by the car to mm-hmm. check on myself. And he stops and actually runs back the other way. Oh. So when I stand up, he had actually come back and flanks me. He's behind you at this point. So he had, so if I'm looking at 12, he's like at 8 o'clock, mm-hmm. 7, 8 o'clock. So I have, my, I have my gun up and I'm looking and the next shot takes the gun out of my hand and it takes my thumb off. Just the whole top of my thumb is gone. I it sprays. I, I know it sounds, I don't know why I'm laughing, but it, it just was one of those things. Everything goes slow-mo. Poof, gun goes. I have no idea where my gun goes. I'm staring at the bone at the end of my finger. And the only thing I can think of is, damn, that's going to leave a mark. I had mm-hmm. nothing else. That's all I'm thinking. I'm like, shit. Now he just keeps shooting. Because at this point, you don't recognize you've been shot in the chin. And there's a. I, there's, I, I honestly thought it, it like just Nick graced me. it. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, okay, because I wasn't talking. I didn't need to talk. Uh, so I was like, okay, that's not bad. But that one in the hand was like, okay, yeah. that 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 sucks. So then he's lighting me up some more. He hits me in the upper arm, hits me in my my femur. Uh, it goes through uh, the side of my thigh, hits the femur bone, uh, rides over, it breaks apart, rides up, and most of it comes out my groin. Uh, so now my left leg is jelly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what I don't know is that Sam is almost there. So Sam's pulling up. He's almost there. He's 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 there, obviously, for for to evaluate the scene. But he doesn't know the taking on that you're taking at this point. No, he just knows I'm there because right. I call on the radio. Uh, he's he's not quite there yet, but he's, he's there. He's coming over he's, that hill you right, described. He's, he's, he's cresting the scene at this point. He's actually, he's popping the median. Okay. Yeah, and you'll see it here. He's popping the median. So, uh, I don't have anything. How like, long has it been? By the way, just before, since you got out of your car to the point where he gets there, just roughly, do you have an idea oh, how say, long that would be? Uh, uh, it's less than a minute. See, that's the crazy part about this whole story is we we go through this in this detail and it feels like it's this really long time. And at the end of the day, it's one minute. It's oh, not, it's not, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a it, matter it, of it, minutes it's, here. You know, so it's 10, 29, yeah. 48 is when, and you'll see him come up. But my shooting's still going on. Wait, and, and we'll get to that part. So... I, I, because I had moved up from my squad, he had circled back. It's me, then him, then my squad. So I can't get back to my squad. I have no idea where my gun is. My left leg's jelly and he's still shooting me. So the only thing I have is there's a car there. Get behind the car, get under the car and I stick my vest out. I just 
give him nothing but my back. And he comes by, boom, 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 shoots a couple more times, hits me in the back. And then there's nothing, man. And this is the weird part about it. There's nothing. It's quiet. There's nobody shooting me. It's the only time in all this that I get like a second to catch my breath. And back to the breathing mm -hmm. thing, close my mouth, breathe through my nose. And as soon as I close my eyes to get a breath in, I see my wife Ann's face. And when mm -hmm. I see my wife Ann's face, I think of my wife and I think of my kids. And I'm like, I'm not dying on a fucking parking lot. This will not happen. I got to get back to my car. And I also know as he walked by shooting, he now gave me access back so I could get to my squad. And I think if I can get back to my squad, I'm just going to hop in and I'm going to run them over. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing I got. It's my weapon. I'm going to kill. Yeah, because one thing that but you recall, I remember you talking about your, your AR got jammed. That's a locking mechanism locking thing. Mechanism yeah, the lock, the lock would not open for me. Yeah, when you tried so to pull it out, you were having a salt Oh, well, it's Murphy's Law. Because, right. you know, it's my, I forgot to mention it too, it's my off day. So I shouldn't even been at work. I'm going on my honeymoon in eight days. So I figured my sergeant had, uh, his kid was graduating ROTC. So we flipped days. Then I go out, I check the, the squad. Yeah, the, the AR release won't work. And I'm like, yeah, what's the big thing? It's a, I'm just going to take it Sunday morning. So it's a, like the convergence of all Murphy laws. Right. So anyway, I... Uh, in my head, I mean, it, it's it's actually good that you talked about the 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 time mm -hmm. uh, manipulation. Uh, I th I think I'm under the car for like thirty seconds, and you know I'm like I got to get back to the car as soon as that's it. And I make that thought: I'm getting to the car, I'm getting to the car, I'm getting to the car. <sighs> All right, here we go. And I roll out. All it was was him going by, boom, 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 ran out of ammo. Drops his magazine, oh. takes another one out and loads it. That's it. So in my head, like you, I'm like, oh, this is taking forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm recollecting my thoughts. I'm getting my drive. And this is just, it's almost like instantaneous. But in my head, it isn't. So when I roll out, he's there with a fresh, uh, a fresh new mag. And now it starts. And he's freaking boom, 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 boom. And back to... The range and everything else. When I'm looking at him, it's like looking at you. Mm -hmm. There's no emotion. He's not excited. He's not yelling. He's not anything. And what is amazing to me, he's using one hand. And now he's just walking me back. Just boom, boom, boom. And in my head, all I can think of is I'm getting to the car. So I'm pushing on my heels and my, in my hands, you know, slide my ass across the drive, you know, the, the the parking lot, and he's just boom, boom, boom. He doesn't have any hearing protection either, does he? He has one. He's he has, not stupid. He kept one hearing thing of hearing protection in his ear. Wow. So one's open, and he's got one right. of the little right. foam so plugs. So he always has. And if you've had the, one of the foam plugs in, they you might come miss out. some. Yeah. Like, but mostly you're going to hear everything, right. you know. Uh, but he knew that just like he left the keys in the ignition of the car so he didn't have to run out and fumble with keys. Leave them in there, come in, you turn it on, and you go. So this was, again, we go back to the old planning. Right. Uh, and, and again, he's just walking me down. Might as well have had a ham sandwich on the other hand because there's nothing. Damn. And I'm like, all right, well, this ain't going good. I, I have to get back to the car. So I, I turn over and I start low crawling like I did in the, in the Marines and he's light me, light me up more and then finally the shot comes. And I, it, he's six foot four and they, it, it, I talked about this a, a lot and only one guy was able to give me a, a reasonable explanation. And like, I never understood why he didn't come closer. He always stays like from a good six feet away. Why not just come up, put the gun against my head and end it? None. And the one guy brought it up because, because in the military, you don't do contact shooting. Everything's from a minimum six, seven feet. It's almost like he's at, staying at a safe distance so that he, you can't right. do anything to him. He's right. got, he's got that control over the situation. All his training has always had him right. do shooting from a distance. Right. And, and it's funny you say that because all in my head, 
I'm like, just get close enough because if I can hook your heel and pull you right. to me, I'm going to fucking bite your face off. <laughs> So I'm not, it's going to be good for me, bad for you. But he never closes that gap. Mm. So as I'm going, I, I'm, I'm still moving backwards. And the shot comes, and that's the one that hits the top of my vest and skims off and goes into the back of my skull. Mm. And that one just flattens me. It's, it's so loud and it's so bright. It's, uh, if you've ever had a concussion, put your concussion on steroids because it was just... Like, I, I can't even explain it. Now, now Sam is here. So After, after all of that. Well, he's... Because it's, it's not, happened not, like in a minute, not, right? Not quite. Not quite. And I'll tell you why. Because, but we're going to watch Sam here. And you're going to hear Sam say his badge number is 45 minus 62. So you're going to hear him say 4, 5 to 6, 2. I hear sounds of shots. Can you confirm? Kind of hard to confirm on a radio when you're the one getting shot. Mm. So he's actually listening to me. So do you have a radio on you and you're hearing that? I got I I no no my my hearings yeah totally. So you, this is just for him. Yeah yeah this is this is an after that I can yeah tell you the script but at the time no and especially with that one in the back of the head that was I wasn't hearing anything for a bit. Okay, so what Sam does is, again, he, we were coming from pretty much the same distance away, but the actual turnaround uh, to head back northbound on is, is a quarter mile away. So you watch him jump the barrier, uh, the median, to get in. Shots. You'll hear him. Okay, so uh, Sam takes six shots, uh, hits him once, uh, goes in his side, cuts him in half, and he's going to bleed out, uh, but he doesn't wait. So the, the one thing that's notable on that is there's Sam. He's got 25 years as a firearms instructor. How many times does a guy yell or does Sam yell, drop the gun? Three, like yeah. Three least. times. How many times should you yell, drop the gun? Once. None. Yeah. Oh, just shoot. If I'm if I'm aiming a gun at you, they, they, all bets are off. Guns travel, but bullet goes a thousand feet per second. You can't outdo that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he did that. Uh, just like I've, at my initial uh, watching this, he drives up mm -hmm. and then he drives back, and I had to ask him like, dude, come on now, why? And he said, well, the last thing you said on the radio was just come in behind me, which I did. I, I didn't have anything. So when Sam gets there, he looks over the top. He says, and I see the guy, a guy waving. He says, it's near your squad. So I thought maybe he's pointing to something. But what he was doing was he'd hold on Sam and then he'd shoot me. And that's why when Sam goes back and he's like, I hear sounds of shots that now at this point, he's just walking me up from behind, pop, pop, pop. Mm -hmm. So now everybody else is going to show up. Uh, 
everybody, there's a, a hill that you'll see off to the right. At the top of the hill, there's a garage. Uh, guys are already up there uh, staging. And as you watch them do this, you'll hear them all yell one more shot. And that's the bad guy killing himself. Okay. So it's hard to tell, but the bad guy is right behind this median right here. Okay. At that point, is that Sam going up the hill? No, Sam's still behind a car. Uh, that was a couple of other guys, John, Dean, and uh, then Derek's up the hill. It really is the best spot to look from. Yeah, you can oversee everything. Yeah, high ground. Okay, so what had happened was uh, after I got that shot in the back of the head, it took me a couple of seconds to shake it off. Mm -hmm. So when they initially yell, where's Murphy? If you look straight down the alley, uh, the, you know, the entrance way, you can see it and Samuels. I don't know where Murphy is. So at that point, I was still in between cars. Uh, and then I was able to shake it off. And then I was getting to the back. Uh, you can see my kind of deposited myself here as a little puddle. Uh, but so right in between where they're talking, you see all the placards there from evidence, uh, there were 26 shell casings. So between me and then he took, I think, two shots at Sam. So he shot me 24 times in that minute or, you know, minute and a half, whatever it is. So by then... Uh, like I said, I was able to shake it off, pull myself out, uh, prop myself up on an elbow. And uh, remember I said I was going to go on my honeymoon, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm laying there and I look down at my hands and my leg and I'm like, man, she's going to be so pissed at me because <laughs> we're not going to be able to go on a honeymoon. That's all I could think about. Not I'm going to die, just my wife's going to kill me. Because we're not going to be able to, you know. Where, were you, where were you going for your honeymoon? Key West. Okay. Uh, it took a year, but we got there. Uh, but at any rate, so that's when you see Sam walk up on him, and then he goes, officer, down. I had crawled out, so now he could see me. Uh, so 24 shell casings. 
So it's 26 around 26. me. Yeah, two probably bet two went to Sam. If you look, there was actually one goes through his windshield. Mm -hmm. I saw that when it came through on the video. Yeah, which is that's 76 yards with a handgun. I'll show you where that, that lands. I. Uh, of the 24, and forgive me for asking, all 24 hit you? No, no, no. just 15. Oh, only 15. It could, be, 15. It could have been 24. It could have, you're hating your <laughs> perspective. Or it could, have, it could have been one in the wrong place, right? Ooh, that, right. Exactly, which wow. well, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I, I'm a big believer in this. Mm -hmm. I, where your brain tells you you go, your body follows, not the other Amen. way. I, so in the, the United States, 82% of people get shot lift. Uh, and if you get to uh, the guy who was the ER doc in Vegas, remember the hotel shooting there? Mm -hmm. At the Country Music Festival. Yep. Uh, I, I had a chance to watch uh, that guy do a presentation, and he said, at least at their hospital, if you make it to the emergency room alive, you have a 99% chance of living, regardless of what shape you're in. Wow. So I, I bring that up just because... I mean, the point being made is I'm no different from anybody else, mm -hmm. that there's nothing. It's just where's your head at and breathing and control. So what we're looking at right now is the back seat of your car. Right. So they we, we practice officer rescue all the time. Uh, so this is actually pretty standard for us. And what they're doing is they're putting you in the back of that car. So he sees cut my vest off to give me some air and let me breathe. At this point, the medics are on the way. They're actually staged right outside the temple, so they're ready to roll. faster if they asked me where I didn't get shot and it's just <laughs> hands and feet and we're done you know you know obviously you know for our audience we're, we're not going to show that video um, for many different reasons but one of the things that I saw in that video um, breathing you breathing a lot obviously not huffing and puffing but deep breaths and the second thing was um, you know the body's fight to flight your your awareness during that and not to go into shock to where you can't communicate what's going on, you know, and you, and you might have been on the edge of that. But that, to me, as I'm looking at that, I, I don't know that I don't know how that happens. So in my head, uh -huh. I, I only because I've witnessed this before. If you're the boss and you lose control, you guys are going to lose control. Everybody's going to lose control. It's going to turn into chaos quick. Right. They go as the leader goes. So in my head, if I my guys are watching me and I'm screaming then there's going to be an issue and I can't have that. So that's in my head was I got to get back to the control. I got to control me. And if everybody's looking and like, okay, he's, he's okay, then they'll operate better. Mm -hmm. And, and that, I think that helped. Uh, I was able, when I got to the hospital, my blood pressure was normal and my respirations were normal. That's unbelievable. Uh, just cause that's all I concentrated on was, I got to breathe. Uh, so it's three in the left hand, wow. three in the left arm, one in the right hand, one in the right arm, each leg, two in the head, uh, one in the chest, one in the side, and then one in the back. 15 shots. So 15, 15 wow. altogether, yeah. When it's your day, it's your day. And when it's not, it's you, it's not. It, this is, there's at least five on me that should have killed me mm -hmm. uh the one is still behind my carotid it's two millimeters behind my carotid artery i still have the one in my skull i have enough 
I told my meniscus back in March, they can't do an MRI on me because I have too much metal in me because mm. I have too much shrapnel and just little pieces of bullet and, and, and whatnot. So there's, you know, it was whether you believe in it or you don't, that was God saying, not yet. Not your day. Not, not, not today. So I, you know, I think you help yourself along for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could talk yourself into shock super quick. And then if you go into shock, things are going to go bad. Right. But I was still able to roll over in the ambulance and yell at the fireman because he's driving to, he's driving like an ass. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm not dead. You know, don't fucking kill me. <laughs> and he just looked at me. His eyes were like saucers. And we're all friends, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the other part of this. You know, Dean's a good friend of mine. I know his family. He knows mine. So now he's looking down at his boss and, and I was his trainer. And his friend. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I know his kid, all that. And now it's hard. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it looks good in the movies, oh, I'll take care of it. But when you have a relationship with somebody, man, it's it's way harder than you think. And that that does cause problems on the back end of things mm -hmm. uh, if you don't take care of it. So I, I'm here and... Uh, I didn't. I don't put Bob's pictures up <laughs> just because it, you know, passed recently. But those are the six people who died, and they went to pray. Mm -hmm. And you should be in. I mean, if that's not one of the safest places, you know, for you to be in, I don't know what is. And just because somebody had a twisted yeah. ideology and wanted to leave a mark, but if I didn't tell you his name, you wouldn't remember his name. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that's so. They all want to leave it, and really, this is the way he ended up. You know what I mean? You could see where Sam shot him. Mm -hmm. uh, round came in here. It didn't come all the way out. Uh, but we, he would have bled out, and then he shoots himself in the head. So I'm I'm very harsh on this, but I'm like, why don't you just do that in the first place? Yeah. If that was going to be your end game, I mean, right. we talked about it before at the 10th anniversary, which was, you know, just that month and a half ago. I'm listening to kids who lost parents and grandparents and will never be walked down the aisle by their father because somebody doesn't like the way they look. It's, I mean, that's, that's, to me, it's unacceptable. It just is. And, and then, you know, on the, the, the flip side of this, you know, I, I was super fortunate because I have people around me, you know, that's my wife and they're in the blue. And if I was a friend, I wouldn't be here. I know that. And my kid brother was, uh, second grade detective with MIPD. They flew him out. Uh, and I was able to, you know, walk myself out 17 days. 17 days later. After the shooting, I had a trachea tube in. I had a feeding tube in my stomach. They, my my throat doctor had told uh, my wife and I, you'll never eat again except out of the tube. Trachea tube was going to be in for the rest of my life. And I'll never be able to talk again. So I remember that was the third day. Uh, we just got out of ICU and went to a regular room, and he, he told us that. And I remember looking at Ann and just shrugged my shoulders because I'm like, okay, that's what we got. We got to deal with that. But then when you're laying there in the middle of the night and you're by yourself and you're thinking about, man, my life was good. Mm -hmm. And now my life ain't so good in the blink of an eye. That's the hard part. How do you pick it up? Mm -hmm. How do you How do you put all those pieces or totally redirect I mean I've been guarding people since I was 18 years old and now I'm 49 at this point and so it's like now what do you do I was getting my master's degree I was working on my thesis at this moment so now that's gone so what what do you do with yourself and that's I, I guess that's when you face adversity of that grand in nature you do have to you have to sit back a second and go all right what's important you know, what are, what are my priorities? And I remember, again, I'm, I'm a huge Stoic fan. And if you like Gladiator, then you know, you know Marcus exactly Aurelius. Yeah. So the impediment to, impediment to action advances actions. And what stands in the way becomes a way. And that's the way I looked at it. What stands in the way is my physical ailments. And I don't know what I'm going to do. So now I'm going to turn that and I'm going to make it. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get beyond this. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my dexterity back. I'm going to work like I always have. And then I'm going to take this, this negative and I'm going to turn it into a positive. And this is going to be the message. You have to do things. You can't sit. You can't stagnate. You can't say, poor me. You have to move on. 
because you know, and yeah, we all know this. Uh, but when it's your turn in the ringer, man, it's different. You yeah. know, uh, it, it, it's just what it's all about. If you don't know what memento mori is, it's just very simply it's Latin for we all die. Nothing you're doing now is is it, 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 you're you're not changing the end game. We're all going to die. It's how we live that separates us. What what is it that you can do every day that's going to make your life? a little bit better than the day before. And not only your own life, somebody else's, you know, and that's back to that. It, it's that one more. It's that little bit every day. It's that that ability to take, I'm going to read a half a second more. I'm going to breathe. The minute I feel myself getting upset, I'm going to breathe. And, and that's what's going to take me back. I'm going to read something I wouldn't normally read so I can grow as a person. Mm -hmm. I, I can get a little wiser about things and more importantly i'm going to become a little more empathetic because i think the more the minute you stop studying the minute you stop doing anything it, it dies it atrophies it's like and, a tree and, exactly and and what's the point then so you you went you bought that you you planted it from a seed you grew it and then all of a sudden a branch broke off and then what do you do go well that's the end of the tree <laughs> no you got you you got to nurture it you got to bring it back redirect it Branches are still going to grow if you give them room to grow. But if you don't water yourself, you don't feed it, you know, it, it, it's all going to be bad. And you know, mimesis, I don't know if it, 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 this comes from Epictetus. So Epictetus was actually with Nero. And what he saw was, and, and all of what was going on was everybody wanted money, everybody wanted power, everybody wanted fame in, in that particular time. And he said, not for anything else other than that's what somebody else had. Mm -hmm. So you get lost in this this whirlwind of, but Quentin has this and Alex has this and they got that and you lose total sight of what makes you happy. You're only worrying about what makes them happy and if it makes them happy, then it'll make me happy. And there's a total falsehood in that. What makes you happy is totally individual to you. And, and and that to me, if you have that healthy aspect, that that happiness aspect, your health and wealth are going to go by because you're going to come to realize, man, when I die, the money ain't going to be there anyway. That's it. Accurate. So uh, you know, when you look at all of this, and I, I noticed it when I was working, I noticed it when I, I was fortunate. I've been to able uh, to travel the world, and and I saw people who really had nothing, like nothing, nothing living on a two by four in monsoon season in Thailand or in, uh, I was in Afghanistan when the Mujahideen were there. And you're right, man, that's nothing. So these, you do come more reflective and say, this is what I want. This is what I want for myself. And the minute I can get myself to a better spot, then I can make sure my wife, my kids and everybody. And that part for me took the longest time was I was one of those guys that always, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? And I, I neglected myself. And you can't do that either. Mm -hmm. You can give, but you got to give to yourself. You got to make time for yourself. And and really, that's the whole thing. Because, you know, if if you have stuff, but you don't have friends to share it with, it's a point. Well, I have it. Exactly. But it doesn't do you any good, you know. And if you don't, if you don't have your family. That's a great photo. Man, you, you don't have anything. And, and, you know, I, I bring this up because, especially in Copland, you know, we have a, such a high rate of divorce because we all are the, the alpha and I'm going to be in charge and I'm not going to share my feelings. And that's just all crap, man. If you're having a bad day, everybody in your house knows you're having a bad day. Right. Own it. Just go, I'm having a bad day. I'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> just give me a little bit of time. I'm going to breathe it out, meditate it out, and then I'm going to come back and go... I was at a car accident today. A two-year-old got killed. It was a sucky day. I'm sorry if I'm not perfectly myself. But you got to give it up. Right. You know, you can't own it and take it to the grave with you. That was the point. And again, it's my, my wife, Ann, was the, was the one because she's, she's wicked smart. And she was like, let me guess, you know, you're going to get another Oscar performance for your nothing happened at work today role. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I guess it's not going as well. And she goes, no, just say what's on your mind. Right. So again, it goes back to 
No, have your family, have your friends, and everything else follows suit. It just, it just all goes along with it, you know. And to be a better leader, man, you got to pick up that broom. Uh, and I, and I always bring up that one of the best books on leadership ever is Legacy, the story of the All Blacks, the winning his sports team in the world. And, uh, you know, in the 19th century or the 20th century, the New Zealand rugby players. And that's what they talk about. If you're the leader of the team, then you got to you got to sweep along with everybody else. Mm -hmm. You got to pick up shit just along with everybody else. You don't get to just sit there, you know, and own it. If you're if you're the boss of a company and the, the new hire does it wrong, you own it as well as they do. You hire the person who hired the person who hired the person that didn't train them. Still a piece of yours. Right. It, it always is. And I tried to be in the back of the squad. Just be the calm in the storm. But be Mr. Kalika. Be that person who can protect people, take care of people, know what's going on, and give it their all. And and people will flock to you naturally because they know you're not going to yell at them, you're not going to scream at them, and echo everything you do echoes with somebody else. Never realize that. To even the 10th anniversary, so I'm... It's the first anniversary, and this goes back to the 15, the Magic 15. Uh, a little woman comes up to me, and she says, oh, Lieutenant, you're my hero. And I go, no, 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 I, Mr. Kalika was hero. That ain't me. And she goes, no, 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 I was in the pantry. And I was like, oh, man, I didn't know, because we didn't get any reports from the FBI. And I said, I'm, I'm happy you're okay. She goes, do you know how many people were in, a, in the pantry? And at that point, I'm like, no, ma'am. And she goes, there was 15 women and children. I'm like, that's incredible. I, I'm just happy. And she goes, you don't get it, do you? And I go, no. And she goes, how many times you get shot? And I said, 15. And she goes, there was exactly 15 of us in there at that moment. And that's when you come to realize, man, as an echo, everything you do echoes, reverberates. And, and that's where you got to look and go, man, I, I got to do good today because it's going to mean something to somebody else down the road. The, I think there's not a person in this room right now that's hair is not standing up on their arms and the back of their necks. When, honest to God, when she first said that to me, I just didn't know how to deal with yeah, how you take that in that. And you're like, man, this, it's bigger. It's it. It's always life's always bigger than you think it is. Do you feel like this event was a catalyst of your beliefs and and uh, training and everything, or did it? totally change your course. Was this an amplifier of things that existed within you? Or yeah. or was this something new that was almost like a revelation? No, I, and I'm glad you asked that because I, I got asked that a bazillion times after like, oh, this was, you know, a divine intervention and you you must be so much different now. And maybe my wife would go, no, he's not. He's exactly the same. There's That's, like nothing has changed. and And fantastic. I thought about that and I thought, why would I change? That's what got me to that point, you know, good and bad, being an absolute obstinate, and my wife will attest <laughs> to that, I'm an obstinate, that helped. Right. It did, but all that training, everything culminated in that. Uh, and and it wasn't, and, and I think it's okay sometimes to take ownership of, I did all that hard work and it paid off, you know? Yeah. So to the person that maybe, you know, like, might look at this and say, well, I don't have your training. How can I try to live this way? Or, you know, wh what do you think about that? Or what would you recommend for them? Okay. So resiliency comes from adversity. So when I was a kid, I, I have two older sisters and I got a uh, younger brother, but my younger brother's six years younger than me. So when we grew up almost like in two different phases, right? Mm -hmm. So every night we got a beating. Every night we got spanking. That's just the way our house was. You ate dinner at five, took a bath at six, and got a spanking at seven. That was that. And but then I got it. My sisters and I would bet who could go the longest without crying. And it got longer and longer. Till finally the old man was like, "Screw this! You guys are wearing my ass out. I'm not doing this every night." Or <laughs> I remember we all used to sleep. We had nothing, like I said, all sleeping in the same bed. And he'd come in with a slipper, and we'd all stick our knees up, and he'd just like... <laughs> and then we'd just be laughing. Because it, it's all temporary, man, uh, to me. Mm -hmm. And and that's how you have to look at it. I mean, I used to... 
I know it sounds weird, but like even washing the dishes, I would make the water hot enough that it hurt. Not that I was burning my hands, but that it hurt. So I knew, okay, this is a little bit more than I feel comfortable, but then I could still get by. And and for, you know, fortunately, unfortunately for me, growing up, I was always one of the smallest guys in my neighborhood. I wasn't that fast. So it was like the trifecta getting beat up every day. And and you learn that all of that, like everything is temporary. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so grow with it. Mm-hmm. Like if that's the worst, it's good. Every day is a gladiatorial event. Something in your day did not go great. And yet here you are. It's going to suck. No, I'm, nobody takes that away. You know, trust me, when I got to get shots in my throat, it sucks. I look at my, my daughter, my oldest, and my sister died in March 2012. Her, and she was like a surrogate to mom, to my daughter. Then her real mother died in June of 2012. And then I get shot in August of 2012. Mm. You're 21 years old, living in South Korea, teaching English. Pretty shit year, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. And we went through this. And she's like, yeah, but. And I'm like, no, no, no. You will probably never have a year that bad in your life. Right. And yet here you are. So what else you got? Because if it's not those three <laughs> things happening again, it's not as bad. That put things in perspective. Yeah. Exactly. And that, you know what it's like. It, 90%, you know, it's like Tony Blower with the fear thing. So much of our our pain and our panic is man-made. It's, it's 90% in our head. Mm-hmm. So that's the hardest part is to clear the imagination from the reality and go, that hurt for really only this amount. And then the rest was me feeling bad about that amount, which was nine times that. So how do you do that? A little bit every day. One more, just one more thing. Yeah. And it sounds like focusing on, on little ways to get out of your comfort zone is super important because that, that seems to be a theme in your life is you constantly just push the envelope a little bit to, to get out of your comfort zone, but not, not to the point where you're trying to run an ultra marathon on the first day. It's, it's the little things and it builds I up. I deadlifted right. more after I got shot than I did before, just cause it was like, you know what? Okay. Next. Yeah. yeah. Now we got next. All right, let's do this. Yeah. Well, your thermostat was changed. That's right. for sure. Exactly. And then, yeah. like, okay. And then once you do that, then you're like, okay, I know I can do that. What else should I try? You know, let me, let me try a little bit of this. Let me try a little bit of that. But we have an antique store. Before that, I know nothing about finishing furniture, wiring, any of that. Do it all now because it's trial and error. And I think that's where we're in a bad spot is we're afraid to fail. Mm-hmm. Mm. And we should never be afraid to fail. Right. Ever. Unless somebody's life is at stake. But other than that, man, I have wrecked more furniture. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have to. You know, that that's where you, you learn. I feel bad for people who haven't faced adversity or have not, never challenged themselves because you don't know what you're capable of. You know, I wanted to point out something. What are the odds when I pick you up today at the airport that literally you're out there talking to a seat guy? I think I blew him away because I, I talked to him in Punjabi. I welcomed him. I saw the dialogue as and I then pulled up and I saw like, him like kind of turn his head like in awe. And yeah, I was wondering what you guys were talking gonna about. So I yeah. just, I, because... I, obviously, I have a, a close connection with the Sikh faith. Mm-hmm. And since 9-11, they're one of the most persecuted religions in the United States because of the way they look. So whenever I have the opportunity, just say, well, hey, somebody knows who you are mm-hmm. and what you believe in, and it's all good. I could tell the uh, the sense of relief and appreciation he had as you walked away to get into my vehicle. There's a lot to take away and kind of unpack from what we just heard. Mm-hmm. We're very thankful that you would come out here today and share the story with us and uh, answer our questions. And I just want to say thank you very I've been, much. Honest to God, thank you for bringing me down again. Yep. I, I, I appreciate you doing what you do because sometimes I think it's so quick to overlook. Everybody's got a story. Everybody's so there's something to learn from somebody. I don't, I don't care who it is. So again, thank you so much yeah. for having me. And uh, you ever need anything, give me a holler. And we'll do. 
And uh, for those that uh, want to hear more about this story, you want to hear more about uh, Brian and, and, and his take on uh, life as well as survival skills, as I heard there, um, visit him at uh, bmurphy at armorexpress.com or BAM training. I think it's BAM training 101 at gmail.com. And then his Instagram is bam.murphy.training, Facebook, BAM training. Guys, get an opportunity to get a chance to reach out. I know he'd love to come talk to your audience and see what he can provide to you guys as he did us. And guys, if you like what you heard, please subscribe, smash up the like button, leave some comments, visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you again for being on the show. Thanks for being on What's Your One More. You guys be safe. Thank you. Thank you. I got one more shot, I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to live, so I put all into 